Action. I've been ready for this one. How many people like to get things going? Get some faith in action. This is one of those things that we kind of, we wrestle with a little bit, right? What does that look like in your life? Right? James 2.18. Now some may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I would show you my faith by my good deeds. This is me. This is what I want it to look like for me. You have to work through your life what you want it to look like for you. But I want people to see my, see my faith. I think sometimes a picture says a million words. So this is one of my favorite pictures I like to look at all the time, right? It's Colonnade Street, which is a big commerce street in the middle of Laodicea. Ain't nothing going on there. Right? Laodicea is situated on a long hill, right? Valleys, beautiful rivers, right? Its neighboring groups are impressive. Ten miles to the west, Colossae. Six miles to the south, Heropolis. And a hundred miles to the east, Ephesus. Ancient Laodicea. Once a thriving city, now lies in ruins, awaiting a more thorough excavation. Right? Okay. Once in a while, guess who goes to Laodicea? A couple of tourists. This group used to brag. They used to talk about, let's, let's look. Revelation 3, 14 through 17. The message of the church of Laodicea. Write this letter to the angel of the church of Laodicea. This is a message from the one who is the Amen. The faithful, the true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. I know all the things you do that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were hot. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will speak you out of my mouth. Okay, this is the Lord speaking. It's all read in our Bibles, right? Yeah, look at your Bible. Okay, you say I'm rich. That's what it says. You say I'm rich. I have everything and I want. I don't need anything. And you don't realize that you are wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked. Okay, why does this matter so much? Because a lot of times I feel like we relate to that. We feel like we have all these things or maybe I don't have enough things. I mean, what could you possibly have to satisfy? What could you possibly get that would be enough? Joy of the Lord, right? This is what ultimately I think fires somebody up. They start realizing there's greater value in life than, than, than the world's wealth. There's greater value in life than pursuing things of this world. So here we go. We've been in a whole section going through this, right? The Evangelical Church Declaration of Faith. I have been going through this whole thing. 19 articles from the Triune God all the way to civil government because of this one verse. One verse. I just wanted to strengthen your doctrine. Okay? Your doctrine. Why? Because what we think and believe up here ends up playing out in the life around us. You guys really believe that? We're going to find out that along the way today. The goal is to strengthen your sound doctrine. The evangelical church influenced by pietism, which is an emphasis on personal faith. Okay? So it's you, your faith, your run with God. We do have some religious formalism. It's needed. Here's a very important question we must all answer for ourselves. Do you have a biblical worldview? Like, I really, seriously caution you. Everybody, I have been floored the last couple months. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. That's what we're going to do. We're going to start, what do we do? We search the internet. We go to the Barnes and Nobles and find the best sellers. And we start chasing things, listening things, podcast after podcast after podcast. 300 gazillion hours of videos being loaded up and people loading them down watching them. And I don't think the people watching them have the ability to discern the truth. Do I think we're a culture that could be deceived? <laughs> Give me a break. So easily. 
so easily, right? Yeah? Can we admit that? Do we know truth? Do you have a biblical worldview? So I went through those things to try and root in, okay? But ultimately, what you think about the triune God, how does that express in the world around you? How does that bring faith into action, right? So, after we got done going through what we believe, we're going to go through our 12 spiritual values and our 8 moral values. This is what we believe in action. Because we're the evangelical church. And we believe our belief should be in action. So think about this for a minute. Values play a pivotal role in shaping our lives and interactions. Values influence our behavior. Have a huge influence on our behavior. They really do. Our values act as guiding principles steering our actions and decisions. When we hold a certain value dear, they impact how we believe various situations. For instance, if we value honesty, okay, so if you value honesty in the room, you're more likely to be truthful. Yeah, this is important stuff. Right? What do you value? They determine our choices. Values serve as filters through by which we evaluate things around us. Okay, do you have a biblical worldview? Are you taking everything in through biblical values? Or just your own, or something you're listening to? For instance, if you value the environment, you might do something to help sustain the environment. Plant a tree. I don't know what you do. You know what I mean? Foundations on identity. Our values form the bedrock of our identity. They reflect what matters most to us and contribute to our self-worth. Guiding actions, self-perception, perception of others, and interpret, interpreting the world around us. Values act as a lens by how you see the world. Right? That's why I always tell people, in the bottom of the bottle, there needed to be another bottle. That was me, I was drunk. Right? Because I didn't like my normal lenses, which means I didn't like people. I just didn't like people. They were too much trouble. So I was much easier to interact with them when I was drunk. I was a much better salesman. The things they said didn't bother me near as much. And then I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and I put on these new glasses and I'm like, oh my gosh, I love this person. Why do I say, like, it doesn't matter who it is. I love humanity. God gave me an undying love for humanity. The marginalized, the poor, the oppressed. And you're not going to believe this. He gave me a huge love for the rich, too. They're hard to love. Right? Okay. Twelve spiritual values. See these declarations of faith. When you're done declaring what you believe, they play out. Twelve spiritual values. Faith, prayer, the word of God, witnessing, worship, fellowship, obedience, spirit-filled life, serving others, body of Christ, stewardship in the Lord's day. Do your values play out? Faith in action. If you value those things, then we should see a lot of that in your life, right? Yeah. Eight moral values. This is one that I always am intrigued by. If you really believe in these things here, then your moral values will be like, you believe in the sanctity of human life. Do you believe in the sanctity of human life? Are you talking positive about humanity? Are you helping preserve humanity? Are you helping humanity press on? Does it kill you that there's 30,000 people in Africa that a one cent malaria pill could save their life? And you don't know how to do anything about it. Because God's called you to do things about other things. Do you believe in humanity? That's a tough one. <laughs> Really, come on, guys. That's a tough one. Do you believe in humanity? Do you believe in marriage? Like, more than I'm going to suck it up and get through it, but have a good marriage. Do you believe in your family? Do you believe in human sexuality, citizenship, the human body, and the human mind? These are all values. Do you value these things? How do you value these things? Well, we're going to be going through all of them, one at a time. James 2, 17 through 24. Everybody turn there, mark it in your book, your Bible. Do values drive you to lead a purposeful life that brings glory to the Lord in all you do? I'm going to be talking a lot about works and actions, okay? Jesus Christ died on the cross. He paid the penalty for our sins. The way to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is to accept that, turn and repent, 
It's a free gift. You didn't have anything to do to, to do it. There's nothing you could have done. Nobody could have opened the book of life if we go to Revelation, right? Jesus paid it all. Okay. But now we're going to step into the nether arena, which is I'm a child of God. And in the Brunner family, and every family, come on guys, there should be responsibilities. There should be things to do. Chores, jobs, work. Yes? Because if you don't have that in your family, I want to join your family. <laughs> really? Like, what family has no chores? A broken, messed up one. Here we go. James 2, 17 through 24. So, so you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, its deeds are useless. Now, someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Do you, don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham, Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see his faith and his actions work together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened just as the scripture says. Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. So when we stay in this doctrinal thing over here, okay, over on this side, okay, was he saved by his faith or his actions? Okay, we're coming over to the other side of the coin. You ready, one? Take faith in one hand. Come on, everybody do this with me. Take faith in one hand, okay? Take actions in the other hand and stuff them into each other. Just put them together and get it going. That's what we need to get, our faith in action. We value the Word of God. Here we go. The evangelical church, our beliefs, our values, and does this biblical worldview call you into action? Do you have faith? Like, really, do you have faith? Because it'll be tested. I think I had my faith tested a couple of times this week when I was writing this message. The Word of God declares that without faith it is impossible to please God. I believe that. Did you hear that? without faith. Okay, this means I don't always get it. I don't always know. I don't always understand. I don't always have the answer right in front of me. Without faith, it is impossible he's God. Hebrews 11, 6, and it is impossible he's God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Are you seeking God? Not because you see it, but because you believe he's there. Through faith, the believer becomes aware of God and of the reality of his presence. Are you aware of the reality of God's presence? Psalm 139, 7 through 10, I can never escape from your spirit. And I felt like this when I first came to faith in the Lord. The Lord was pursuing me. He pursues us, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. And if I go to the grave, you are there. If I ride, ride the wings of the morning, and if I dwell by the forest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. Do you believe that? Through faith, the believer becomes confident of God's mercy. Right? Are you confident of God's mercy? A partaker of his saving grace? Aware of his favor? Aware of his favor? Do you know that God has favor on you? Are you aware of that? Aware of his favor and his fellowship. Romans 10, 8 through 11. This is exciting stuff. I love this stuff. Right? In fact, it says the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart. And that message is the very message about faith that we preach. Good, right? If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. How cool is that? For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in him will not be disgraced. This is exciting. Faith is a means of development. I don't like what's happening to me. Well, I don't like going through it with you either. But let's do it. Right? Come on. Faith is a means of development. 
progress in the Christian life made through the diligent exercise of faith and the performance of those duties which belong to the life of a believer. We walk by faith, not by sight. Romans 12, 1 and 2, a living sacrifice to God. That's what it says right at the top of all of our Bibles. A living sacrifice. So this isn't fun. This isn't I like it all the time. This is God's got a plan. Let's get fired up about that. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behaviors or the customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Faith is a means of development. It just keeps going on in Romans 12, 3 through 5. Because of the privilege and the authority God has given me, you too. Give each of us this warning. Do not think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluations of yourself, measuring yourself by the faith God has given you. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so does with Christ's body. We are many parts. One body. And we all belong to each other. Are we working for each other? Are we working together? Or are our lives a little bit too much our own? Well, let me just break the news. I think our lives are a little bit too much our own. It's part of the thing that God's put on my heart, right? One of my main jobs is to help create community here, right? <laughs> That's a tough gig. In 1960, all I had to do was have a block party. The whole block shows up. A tough gig to create community in the year 2024. Yeah, let's own that. Romans 12, 6 through 11. We're still going to do it, though, because God calls us. Calls us to be community. In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. I hope this is talking to people in here today. we got to get busy. If your gift is to encourage others, be an encouragement. If it is giving, then give. Dump it out. If God has given you leadership ability, take that responsibility seriously. Lead. And if you have a gift to show kindness to others, do it gladly. Don't just pretend to love others. I just keep reading that. Don't just pretend to love others. Apparently we need to be told that. I think we do too. Okay, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tight to what is good. Love each other with general affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Whew! That was quite a call, wasn't it? Yeah. That's why I think it's easier to go to bed. I do. I really do. I think it's easier to just go. We all have a different place we call our bed, but it's easier to just go to bed, right? It's easier to just go walk my dog. Go do nothing, right? It's exhausting, isn't it, to think of all the, hey, God strengthens us. God equips us. Have you tried lately walking in what he's called you to do? It goes like this. Oh, I'm kind of doing all the chores and everything and I feel this call and it goes on and then boom! When you step into your power spot in ministry, you get new energy. You get a new strength. You can soar. That's how you know it's your strength. That's how you know it's where God wants you. That's why I always tell people, just keep trying to do things for the Lord. You'll hit sweet spots. You'll find out where it works better. You'll find out where God can use you better. But I tell you what, I have said this for years and years and years and years and years and years and years. Do you know what the enemy of greatness is? Average. Just average. You don't even need Satan. You just need average. I got to see... Especially when nobody's looking at your scores and nobody's looking at your grade cards anymore. Then you're okay with C's. I find most people are comfortable with D's. I mean, nobody's really looking at the scoreboard but you and God anyways, right? So you can do whatever you want with it. Faith in action. Faith calls for action. I don't believe you can do faith without being in action. And so before we move past faith, I challenge you. Figure out how your faith is in action. Sometimes it's in action because you're just holding on. 
And sometimes it's an action because you're pressed in. Let's keep moving forward. We value prayer. How many people are in here value prayer? Yeah, come on. We all should. I know. I just love that. The ones that raise their hands are the ones that share their prayer journals with me. Isn't that hilarious? I love that. Praise God, right? Do you have a prayer journal? Here's what I got to say about pray. Christ prayed often and said that men should always pray and not lose heart. Luke 18, 1. One day Jesus told the disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. See, you should always pray and never give up. Jesus taught his disciples to pray and gave them a brief but comprehensive pattern which embodies all the elements of true prayer. So everybody open up. Matthew 6, 9 through 13, because I'm going to fly through this. You ready? Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. Jesus starts by establishing our identity as children of God. Do you really believe that when you pray, your Father in heaven hears you? Do you believe that? Do you believe that when you pray, your Father in heaven hears you? May our kingdom come, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as in heaven. Jesus makes a point in God's agenda before your own. Okay, you good with that? God's agenda before your own. Good. Give us today the food we need. No request is too big or too small for God. But examine the motives behind what you ask for. Seriously, does it have to do with food for today? Or are all stuck somewhere way out there on something really big? It's food for today. Give us today the food we need. Forgive us as our sins as we forgive those that sin against us. Forgiveness was at the heart of Jesus' teaching. You know, we follow a God of reconciliation. I don't care what's going on. I don't care how whacked out it is, how messed up it is, how just unbelievably impossible it seems. I'll stand in the middle and say we follow a God of reconciliation. You know why I say that? Come on, everybody goes, because if you didn't, you're a liar. Yeah, we follow God of reconciliation. He's reconciling the world to himself constantly. Constantly. Do we believe that? And forgive us of our sins as we forgive those against us. Forgiveness is at the heart of his teaching. And do not lead us into temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Jesus closes his prayer by telling us to keep in mind that the Christian life is a spiritual battle. Do you view your life as a spiritual battle? Do you have an active prayer life? Action plan. Active prayer life? Ephesians 3, 20 through 21. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Prayer is a way of seeing God work within other lives? Yes. Prayer is a means of diving deeper into God's power. Okay, how does that work? It strengthens you. Trust me. It does. I wrote this. May God find us often before his throne, for we have a high priest in heaven who can identify with all that we go through. Hebrews 4, 15 through 16. This high priest of ours understands our weakness, for he has faced all the same tests we do, yet he did not sin. That's an even better way of saying it, isn't it? That's how God said it. Right? Do you find yourself saying things all the time over and over? Maybe you don't say them perfect, but it's a verse you have memorized to help strengthen you? That's fine. Do it. All right? He's our high priest. May God find us often before his throne. This high priest of ours understands our weakness, for he faced all the same testings we do. Yet he did not sin, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. In your darkest moments... Yeah, right here, right there. You just come find God right there. We have God's promise that prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. Do you believe in that? I'm working on that in my own life. It's part of one of the reasons I pursue holiness. I know I'm not holy, and I know God is only holy, but I pursue it with a desire of righteousness so that God might use me. 
James 5, 16 through 18, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other also that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Elijah was a human as we are, and yet he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall. None fell for three and a half years. <laughs> like, wouldn't you want to pray like that? Don't you want to pray like that? Get the heart right so much with God that you were lined up so much you knew God's will? Think about that. Then when he prayed again, the sky set down, rain, and the earth began to yield his crops. I feel like it's time we pray for rain now. <laughs> and the Spirit moved him because he was so lined up with God. May God glorify his name in our lives as we pray to him, right? Prayer is not simply a Christian duty. It's a privilege of every sincere and trusting heart. If you have an active prayer life, that's what I'm really wondering lately. You guys, I think personally, on a personal level, we're really good at praying for others. But I'm not so sure we have an active prayer life for ourselves, for our daily activities, for our daily routine, routines, what God wants from me, what God wants me to do with my stuff. We're pretty good in this congregation at praying for big things. We hit them. You know what I mean? But do we pray for the little things? And does God want you praying for everything? Last one of the day, the Word of God. We value the Word of God. We believe that the Bible is crucial in establishing and developing and sustaining spiritual life. So, this is taking the Word of God. Not only do we believe the Word of God is truth, we also believe it's crucial in establishing, developing, and sustaining spiritual life. Praising God for His words. The Bereans were of more, more notable character because they were in God's word. Acts 17, 11 through 12, and the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. And they listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. And as a result, many Jews believed, as did many of the prominent Greek women and men. They believed in the Word of God. They studied it. They studied it so hard that today, when you go around to churches in America, okay, there's a lot of times you can go, hey, do you have a Berean Bible study? They'll know what you're talking about. It's a group that studies a little deeper, a little harder, a little more. Wouldn't you like to be known to be a group like that? Come on, guys. I have hidden your word in my heart. Psalm 119, 11 through 12. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I praise you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. The Bible should be studied daily, prayerfully, diligently, systematically, so that the believer may grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? A lot of times we're reading and studying the Bible to get smarter. Personal growth. How do you read that for personal growth? Second Peter 3, 17 through 18. You already know these things, dear friends, so be on guard that you, you will not be carried away by errors of the wicked people and lose your own secure footing. Rather, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. All the glory to Him, both now and forever. 2 Timothy 3.16 This is one that I often ponder. Do you really believe when somebody picks up the Bible and stands before you and says this? Because you want to come in and battle something out with me. Let's battle this one out. All Scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16-17 All Scripture is inspired by God. I'll defend that. It is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. <laughs> yeah, I'll buy into that. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses a prayer and equipped his people to do every good work. Remember, okay, he didn't just call us to get smart about this book. He called us to actually put it in our heart, use it to transform. And I tell you what, if you want to be smart about that book, there's people that I know that are so smart about that book, it blows my mind. Okay? But that doesn't mean they figured out how to get it in their heart. Yeah, so we just got to figure that out. Okay, so I want to read this really quick. Good thing I found it again. I hear all the time I'm not getting anything from God right now. 
so I'm not going to look at anybody. Okay? I hear it all the time, though. I'm not getting anything from God right now. Okay, food for that. God uses his word to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Are you in his word to hear from him? Or to just study it? And are you taking his word and are you applying it to the good work he has prepared for you? Because when you start taking God's word and applying it to yourself and the work he has for you, it's off the charts how the Spirit speaks and how the book becomes alive and how God starts talking to you through it, right? Amen? I'm not the only one that experiences this, right? Okay. Evangelical church are beliefs and our values. That, that Bible is important in our doctrinal series. Pastor Doug did a really good presentation on what the Bible is. I would encourage you all to go watch it again and again and again and again and again and again and again because it's really good. And again and again. Until you believe in the Bible so much that you have daily practice of reading it. That your faith drives you to a prayer life that drives you into the Word of God that drives you into the world to help free the captives. It's called faith in action. I mean, we do want to live a purposeful life, don't we? Again, our values drive us to lead purposeful lives and brings glory to the Lord in all we do. This week we studied three spiritual values, faith, prayer, and the Word of God. Do your values drive you to lead a purposeful life? Let's read this first one last time. you got your faith in your actions, and you're walking out the door with them this week. I want you to crush them together and get them going together and think about ways God can do that. So let's close with our verse, James 17 through 24. So you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. Now someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions work together. His actions made his faith complete, and so it happened just as the scripture said. Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. I don't know where your faith is with the Lord right now today, but grab onto whatever you got and lean in and start moving with him. He's an amazing God, and he'll help you go deeper. Let's pray. Father God, we just praise you for all that you're doing. Lord, we praise you that you are a God who loves us. Lord, we just praise you that long before we ever knew you, you were faith in action, moving on our behalf. And Lord, we praise you for that, Lord. Uh, Lord, we all need to give our heart to you in a new way every day. We all should desire to go deeper with you every day. And so, Lord, tug on our hearts today. Give us a burning desire in your spirit to become more holy. Give us a burning desire to put our faith into action. Give us a burning desire to touch a broken world in the way that you want each one of us to do that in our own special way. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.